Good morning. It is great to see everyone live and in person. Um, welcome, I'm Dave Altig, the current president of NAVE, and I am here to introduce you to the 38th annual NAVE Policy Conference. I have zero job to do not, right now other than that, uh, with the exception of reminding everyone to download the NABE Connect app because that will be the way that you will be able to ask questions uh, to uh, all of the general session speakers. Uh, and I guess I should say a welcome to all the people joining us virtually as well, and the same instructions go for you. Uh, so without any further um, messing around by me, I'd like to introduce Ellen Zentner, Chief Economist of Morgan Stanley, who will introduce our first speaker. Thanks. Hey, good to see everybody. Good morning. This is so exciting. I don't, I don't know if uh, you all put one of the colored dots on your badge, um, but I learned that it doesn't matter what color you have on, people are just going all in. Um, <laughs> But I figure we're all comfortable with that since no one's masked up and we're all in a room together. But isn't this crazy? It just feels exhilarating and terrifying at the same time. Uh, so uh, yeah, as Dave mentioned, I've got a nifty pad here where I'm gonna be pulling up questions uh, during our session with President Bostic. Uh, and so please ask questions um, and I'll just skip past them and ask my own <laughs> joke. <laughs> Uh, so since, uh, since 2017, uh, Dr. Rafael Bostic has been at the helm of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. He could not have taken office at a better time. Uh, President Bostic has spent uh, decades, and that's not meant to talk about how our, you know, our age, but he's spent uh, decades studying housing, inequality and home ownership, uh, the health of neighborhoods, uh, and how institutions can help shape policy. And the bulk of that was done as a professor in the School of Policy Planning and Development at USC. President Bostic spent four years at HUD advising the secretary on its policies and programs. Uh, and his advisory roles uh, have focused on diversity and inclusion. And I always tell folks that if I could build the perfect economist, they would not just have degree in economics, but also psychology. It's exactly what he studied uh, at Harvard before going on to get his PhD at Stanford. Uh, so I would say that uh, he is the right leader uh, at the right time. So President Bostic, please give us your remarks. Well, thank you, Ellen, for the very kind introduction and uh, it's all right, you can call me old. I, I'm, I'm good with it, so. I think we're the same age. <laughs> uh, I've been old for a long time, so, uh, so this is my teen years, so it's, uh, so it's fine. And, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's truly a pleasure to address the National Association for Business Eco Economics. You know, over the years, uh, the Federal Reserve and the Atlanta Fed in particular have established a very strong relationship with NAVE. And this is perhaps most evidenced by the fact that my research director, Dave Alte, is the organization's president. You, you heard from him today to start kick us off and he'll be around sort of managing and running all sorts of things, just like he does in our building. Uh, now our connectedness uh, has served the Fed well, as we have benefited from the organization's good work to advance economic thinking. Uh, but it has also served the profession well, as it has allowed us to work together to strengthen the field. And here, I'll applaud NABE's uh, efforts to increase diversity among our ranks. Uh, thank you for your commitment to this and to other efforts to enhance the field. And here, I'll just say last night, I got to meet a bunch of students. There are a number of students here. Um, this is a great opportunity for them to see and learn about the field. So as you're going through the day, uh, look for some of them and, uh, and pass on some of your wisdom and experiences. It's sort of how we get the next generation started. So, so please uh, take that seriously. Now, as you probably know, uh, speaking invitations like this are made months in advance. Uh, when my team and I received NAVE's invitation, uh, we thought that I would, be I would talk about an emerging trend 
or a dynamic that would shape the economy in 2022. Now, as I'll discuss shortly, we honed in on labor market dynamics, specifically how the labor market might regain a balance between supply and demand. But then Russia invaded Ukraine, and the conflict, first and foremost, is a human tragedy. And my thoughts go out, my thoughts and prayers go out to all the Ukrainian people and all victims of the fighting. But in fact, the conflict is a stark reminder that there are many conflicts and many victims across the globe. And I'm keeping all of those who are impacted by this in my prayers as well. Now, beyond its terrible human toll, uh, this war on the European continent is reverberating through the global economy. The conflict, economic sanctions, and other disruptions to global trade and finance will influence virtually every factor the Federal Open Market Committee considers in formulating monetary policy. So I think it's only appropriate that I will say a few words on this as well. Now, a common theme that connects labor market dynamics and the Russian invasion of Ukraine is uncertainty. Uncertainty enshrouds both, and this requires that we be extra observant and prepared to adapt our thinking about the economy and policy, perhaps even more so than we usually are. Now, before I go any further, please keep in mind that the thoughts I express are strictly my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of my colleagues on the committee or at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Now, let me start where I'd originally planned to by talking about the labor market. While the pandemic has introduced considerable uncertainty, one thing we know is that the labor market is tight. The headline unemployment rate quickly fell to 3.8% from a stunning high of 15%, as 90% of the jobs lost when the coronavirus hit U.S. shores have been recovered. This is an extremely fast rebound. This rapid rebound has translated into another labor market truth. There is currently a significant imbalance between labor supply and demand. The Bureau of Labor Statistics Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey, uh, you guys know this as the JOLTS, uh, reported about 11 million job openings a month on average over the nine months through January. Employers filled only about 60% of those positions. So each month, roughly 4 million open jobs have gone unfilled. Now, these aggregate data are corroborated by respondents in the Atlanta Fed Survey of Business Inflation Expectations, or BIE. In January, more than 60% of the respondents cited labor availability as a problem, and more than half of those rated the problem as moderate or severe. Now, resolving this imbalance is critical because the labor shortage is keeping businesses from responding fully to the strong demand for products from U.S. consumers, which is a key driver for the high levels of inflation that we currently see. As a result, we are very closely monitoring labor market developments. And there are here many questions to track, and the answer is unfortunately quite uncertain at present. So let me just pose a few for us to ponder. Will some of the wave of excess retirees return to the labor force? What will be the labor market response of families with young children? And in this regard, how will childcare rebound, which will be a vital question for mothers who disproportionately left the labor force? How will families respond now that fiscal and monetary policy supports have expired? And of course, there's COVID. We like to think we are mostly past the pandemic, but just this month, China locked down some major cities, including certain manufacturing hubs in moves that could further foul global supply chains. We don't know if there will be another variant or whether existing vaccines and boosters will be as effective against them as they have been for other strains. We don't know if vaccination rates will continue rising. And a further question is whether we have learned enough that should another variant emerge, we will continue on with minimal economic disruption. Now, an additional development will be the behavior of firms. And we are already getting clues about this. As you know, classical economic theory suggests that an imbalance between weak labor supply and strong demand should translate into a higher price of labor. Well, firms are proving the theory correct. The Atlanta Fed's wage growth tracker is showing the sharpest increases in nominal wages since 2001. 
February's reading showed a three-month moving average of 5.8% median hourly wage growth. Similarly, respondents to our BIE survey reported that they anticipated wage growth this year of about 6.5%. Now, as an aside, this expectation is consistent with what we are hearing from business leaders across the Southeast. Now, interestingly, business lead decision makers are telling my staff and me that they don't expect a quick cure to this challenge. And research by Atlanta Fed economist Julie Hotchkiss highlights one reason why this might be right. Julie found that higher wages alone may not be enough to draw Generation Xers and Millennials into the labor force. And that is important because those two demographic groups constitute the bulk of the labor force, nearly all prime age workers. And as you're aware, these are workers 25 to 54 years old. Now examining historical labor market behaviors, Julie shows that compared to baby boomers, a given pay raise is only about half as likely to draw gener generation Xers to the worker pool, and only three quarters as likely to attract millennials. And what does this mean for the current labor market? Julie estimates that a 6% rise in nominal average hourly wages, as the BLS reported for January, would close just 17% of the gap between labor force participation for prime age individuals in January of 2022, and the rate that prevailed immediately before the pandemic. So this suggests that the efficacy of the traditional enticement to draw labor, that is wages, is lower than it used to be. And this means that today's labor force participation gap would be unlikely to be fully filled even if wages were rising in real terms, which they are not presently. Now that said, we are seeing signs that non-wage measures might act as an important supplement to wages. We are hearing growing anecdotal evidence of the appeal of measures such as firms allowing employees to fashion their own hybrid remote office work schedules, offering more generous dental and vision benefits, providing higher educational allowances and student loan repayment assistance, mandating a four day work week and instilling a larger purpose into work beyond collecting a paycheck and boosting shareholder value. Now we'll closely track how employers embrace these innovations and the degree to which they help reduce the prevailing imbalance between labor supply and labor demand. Now, let me turn now to the tragic war in Eastern Europe. While there is much that we will learn about the economic fallout over the coming weeks, there is much we can't foresee. Now that notwithstanding, I do see three high level economic repercussions that will almost certainly play out. Intensified uncertainty, upward pressure on prices, and further momentum toward reorienting production and supply networks away from pure cost minimization and toward resilience and risk tolerance. So first, the conflict is an extraordinarily fluid situation. In an economic context, the war is supercharging what was already a great deal of uncertainty. And we have not completely shed the ambiguity created by the coronavirus pandemic. And now we have new events in Europe introducing deep and multifaceted risks to the economy and the economic outlook, and thus the making of monetary policy. Uncertainty is, well, uncertain, but we know that nobody likes it and it will undoubtedly influence the behavior of business leaders and consumers. If the past is a guide, Increased uncertainty is likely to reduce engagement and economic activity by businesses and consumers, especially as it pertains to longer run investments. Now, I will emphasize we are not currently hearing this from our contacts, and we've been ex asking this question explicitly, but it is still early, so this will bear watching. Now, in terms of direct effects, the fighting and attendant disruptions are generating upward pressure on the prices of products for which Ukraine and Russia are, in part, are important global producers, including oil, natural gas, wheat, and ammonia. Now these are all basic inputs into numerous goods, including gasoline, plastics, heating oil, electricity, fertilizer, and many food products. So the price implications are potentially quite broad. Moreover, the war is exacerbating already significant global supply chain challenges. 
Closed air spaces and a reluctance to use shipping lanes linked to the Black Sea will be disruptive in the short run and even possibly into the medium term. And it remains to be seen how far that reach will extend. Now, let me turn to some specifics here. Gasoline at the pump has already risen to about an average of $4.35 a gallon across the United States. That is a historic high in nominal terms. Now, the United States does not import much oil and gas from Russia, but as you know, the market for energy is global and supply, demand, and price are determined accordingly. According to the International Energy Agency, Russia is the world's second largest natural gas producer, providing some 40% of the European Union's total gas consumption. Russia is the third largest producer of oil behind the United States and Saudi Arabia, and the world's second largest crude oil exporter behind Saudi Arabia. It appears very likely that sanctions and Russia's own export restrictions will limit Russian oil and gas exports. Now, there are producers who can fill this gap, yet all indications are that it will take time, and in some cases, policy changes to increase production in countries other than Russia. Now, the European Union is particularly dependent on Russian energy. Disruption in energy supplies and deeper general uncertainty, which figures to be even more acute on the European continent, given its proximity to the conflict, uh, could imperil economic growth in the EU. And that is another risk we must, want, we must monitor. Now, as for US energy production, we probably have some room to grow, but increased export activity probably won't happen without some complications. Energy industry contacts in our district say that while there are indeed excess supplies of oil and gas, for now, we lack enough infrastructure to mine, store, process, and transport it, at least in sufficient quantities to make a difference in the shorter run. Regarding natural gas, for example, the country lacks sufficient capacity to refrigerate the gas molecules so they can be transported on ships. Now, we can build infrastructure. The catch is that it is very capital intensive, it takes years to construct, and there are extensive regulations to navigate. Now, as for fertilizer, the district's farming contacts tell us their cost for this input had risen substantially even before Russia invaded. The BLS's producer price index shows that mixed fertilizer prices rose 33% for the 12 months through February. And they could climb further because Russia is among the world's leading suppliers of fertilizer ingredients like ammonia, urea, and processed phosphates. And wheat has a similar story. The United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization ranks Russia the world's largest wheat exporter and Ukraine fifth. With much of that wheat off the global market, prices are likely to climb for bread, pasta, and various packaged goods. Now, the United States could ramp up wheat production, but again, here it is complicated. In recent years, about half of US wheat has been exported. But the USDA reports that our share of the world's exports has declined from around 25% a year in the early 2000s to about 13%. And likewise, the amount of American farmland devoted to growing wheat has shrunk. US farmers, harvested 50 million acres of wheat a year in the early 2000s, but that's down to 38 million acres in the past five years. So there could be capacity to grow more wheat, but much like building industry, building energy industry infrastructure, major shifts in agricultural production do not happen quickly. For example, many crops have only one planting season a year. Now, in addition to increased uncertainty, and rising commodity prices, the third implication I'll note is that the conflict in Ukraine likely will contribute to and accelerate a fundamental shift that is taking place regarding production strategies. Already, we have heard an unmistakable message from direct contacts and surveys that global firms are moving away from a ruthless focus on cost minimization in configuring production networks. Supply chain disruptions caused by the coronavirus pandemic prompted business leaders to start diversifying supplier locations and firms, increasing inventories, 
and bringing production closer to final markets to maximize reliability. Now, this is the oft-mentioned shift to just-in-case inventories from just-in-time. Now, the common thread in all of these changes is that they increase production costs. The Russia-Ukraine conflict will trigger similar considerations for producers, albeit for different reasons and in different geographies than was the primary focus of pandemic responses. In short, it's becoming increasingly risky for a company to rely on any part of the world as its sole source of an input to production. And this will likely cause an increasing number of firms to shift their production strategies to more certain but higher cost approaches. Now, I realize the, the, the three con uh, consequences I've discussed here are pretty sweeping. And I also realize that I've covered them at a very high level. Many of the details that, uh, that exist remain to sort themselves, but the general direction these trends will take the macroeconomically, the macroeconomy in seems clear. In sum, structural economic forces emanating from the Ukraine conflict appear to be adding upward pressure to costs. Now this all has serious implications for monetary policy. So let me close by saying a few words on this. As you know, uh, the FOMC releases its summary of economic projections or SEP four times a year. Now one part of the release that receives considerable attention is the dot plot chart that details how each member projects the appropriate path for the Fed funds rate for the next several years. Late last year, I projected that the committee would increase the federal funds rate three times in 2022. Well, since then, the challenging economic conditions we were confronting then have only become more challenging and, as I've discussed here today, more uncertain. And there is plenty we don't know but let's look at what we do know. Obviously, the baseline for inflation has moved up significantly. Now, my original outlook was that inflation would likely to begin to decelerate this spring, and that now almost certainly won't happen. Now, let me say this clearly. Getting the high rates of inflation under control is the top concern that I have for 2022. And I could say a whole lot more on this about inflation and, and, and these dynamics, uh, but I do understand there's another speaker on the program this morning uh, who has some views on this, and you might be more interested in hearing from him. Uh, so I'm going to leave some space there for him to cover those topics. I will say that in the latest SCP, I penciled in six rate hikes for 2022 and two more for 2023. Now, on this front, I recognize that I am toward the bottom of the distribution uh, relative to my colleagues. But the elevated levels of uncertainty that I've discussed today are front forward in my mind and have tempered my confidence that an extremely aggressive rate path is appropriate today. Events are shifting rapidly and we could see marked changes along key dimensions such as aggregate demand that could warrant quickly adjusting the trajectory of policy. Now here, the risks go both ways. Should demand falter in the face of economic uncertainty or removal of monetary policy accommodation, then the appropriate path may be shallower than I currently project. But there are other developments such as shifts in supply strategies that could mean higher costs and thus motivate a steeper policy path than I expect. And this is one reason that I and my team have adopted the phrase observe and adapt to characterize our approach to policymaking. We are observing closely and will adapt as appropriate. For instance, our research staff currently has surveys in the field, and I would mention our survey of business uncertainty as one notable example, to gauge how business leaders are thinking about pricing and production strategies and how they are managing amid compounding uncertainty. The real-time information we gather through these and other means will be critical in helping us position our policy to be maximally effective. So let me close with this. There is a lot of uncertainty in the economy and the world today, but I want you to leave with one notion that is very certain. We at the Fed will do all in our power to meet our mandate and make sure that elevated inflation does not become entrenched in the economy for years to come. Thank you very much.
Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for those remarks. Um, I'm going to start off uh, with a couple of questions here. And, and uh, uh, I believe someone's sending through the questions uh, for President Bostic. Um, and so I'm going to wrap those into our conversation. Um, but thanks for that. That was really helpful diving into geopolitics. Um, I guess observe and adapt describes uh, your speech overall since you started out writing on something different or focusing on something different. That, that's exactly right. So uh, <laughs> you know, we, we started working on this several months ago and it was all going well. We, had a, we basically had a full speech written uh, and then uh, the Ukraine invasion happened and it introduced so many changes in terms of the types of things we were talking about in the building. I felt like if we were going to be helpful for, for, the, for participants and, and the general public, they needed to know what we're thinking about and uh, how we're um, considering the information as it's coming in. And it's been, um, it's been very fast flowing. You know, I mentioned some of our surveys. Uh, we also have a team that we call our Regional Economic Information Network. And they call business leaders and others and have one-on-one -on -one conversations. Well, since the war started, we have really ramped up our outreach in that space as well to try to get as much information in real time about how businesses are changing their strategies, what they're seeing in prices, and their projections for how long the impacts are going to go. It's, it's been, uh, you know, we did the same thing two years ago, almost exactly two years ago when the, the coronavirus uh, hit our shores. Uh, and it seems like we're in just one of those cycles. It's yeah. a crazy time. So you said in your remarks that um, almost certainly uh, inflation would not peak in the spring as you as you thought. Um, I know as a good economist that almost certainly leaves room for a margin of a margin of error. Uh, and so, um, is it you know evidence that inflation isn't coming down at all, say by the middle of the year and the back half of the year, that would make you change your thinking about how many rate hikes? Uh, you would be in favor of? Yeah, so um, you know, my goal in thinking about the, the path for policy is, you know, we've been in an emergency uh, posture for a long time. Uh, going into the pandemic, we didn't know what was going to happen. We wanted to leave no question about monetary policy's role in helping families and businesses remain stable uh, and functional. Um, and so we're past that now and from an economic perspective. Uh, and I think that we need to get as quickly as we can to neutral. Uh, the problem or the challenge that we have is that with all the uncertainty, it's hard to know how quick is going to be too quick or too slow. Uh, and so my eight moves would get us to something like two and a quarter. Uh, that's where I currently estimate neutral to be. Uh, and exactly when we get there and how fast, I'm going to let sort of experience guide. So I, I have six. That's a, that's a guess, uh, assuming that certain things are going to happen this year. Um, but you know, as, at the end of my, my remarks, I talked about it could go faster than that if, if developments occur uh, in such a way that it seems that that's warranted, or it could go slower. I, I'm really in a, I'm truly observing and adapting in real time because uh, it just seems like there's just so much going on. And every, every day, I, I kind of joke with people sometimes that I, I used to feel like I knew and understood the world. Uh, and now the world is continually surprising me. Uh, and because of that, I never want to be too sure and declare things so definitively uh, when things can happen really rapidly uh, and just change our fundamental understanding of basic things. Yeah, I think, do uh, you think that's what attracted you to economics in the oh, first no. place? No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. You know, when, when I said uh, people don't like uncertainty, I count myself among them. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I got into econ because, you know, I, I, I just love vitality, innovation, and growth, and uh, the inputs that allow people to sort of live their dreams. Uh, and so much of that is in the econ space. And, and so I was first driven or drawn to the field uh, just because I wanted to know why cities grew and what made them interesting and vital and vibrant. Uh, and that kind of led to a path where, you know, we got into mortgages and, and uh, now, now monetary policy. But it's, it's that underlying dynamic that, that still is interesting. And I still feel like there's a lot to learn there. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a profession that continues to give me opportunities and, and keep things interesting. That's great. That's great. 
Uh, so I wanted to talk to you, and I do want to come to housing. Mm -hmm. um, it would I would be remiss to not get your expertise in that area. So, um, but before that, you know, talk a little bit about what you're seeing in financial conditions, because uncertainty, of course, impacts markets. Um, is there anything in the credit space, and especially when you think about uh, your constituents that uh, low mortgage rates would help for them, tighter credit spreads would help them? You know, what are you seeing there? Is there anything worrisome so far in terms of financial conditions? So this is a, you know, this is a difficult um, question. I, I, at a very basic level in this country, credit conditions are pretty stable. Um, you know, going, coming out of the Great Recession, uh, the, the banking markets and, and credit markets really were staying away from the riskiest type of lending. And so we entered this, this phase in a, in a much more stable and secure way. And when I talk to, to bankers in, in my district, they tell me that the performance of uh, their credit portfolios are like at historic highs. They're just, they're not getting delinquencies, they're not getting defaults anywhere close to where things were historically. And that hasn't really changed. Um, I think for all of us moving forward, the question is, you know, how, are we in a new normal where that's just gonna become the new dynamic for credit? Or will we eventually get uh, back to where we have historically been? Um, and the, the, you know, the one uh, wild card in that is consumers and how they approach uh, this, this uh, near post-pandemic uh, uh, economy. You know, during the pandemic, when everyone was sitting home, there were lots of folks who just weren't going to restaurants, they weren't doing their trips. So their bank balances, uh, their savings and deposits just went up just by virtue of not doing things. And you know, bankers report that for many, those balances are still up. Uh, and so the ability to cover debts and, and other obligations is just very strong. Now, I had actually expected the balances to come down a lot faster than they have. Uh, and you know, the, it's an interesting question about whether that's because of all this uncertainty and people are still holding back a bit, or is it just that it takes time to work through all this stuff that you've deferred consumption for so long that you, know, you have to work on those things. So, um, so that's a long way to say we're doing fine now, uh, but uh, we, are, we have to watch because uh, there are many for whom um, they could be nearing precariousness again. Yeah. So um, let's talk about what you're observing in, in housing in particular. Um, you know, I mentioned you know, mortgage rates are, are going up, but of course, from historically low levels. Um, prices of lumber, you know, that's something that you've focused on as well in terms of making the cost of housing go up. And then I am astounded at uh, the vacancy rates in multifamily um, and that rents are just um, extraordinarily burdensome and especially for the lower income households. How are you, how would you deal that with that from a policy perspective, having advised HUD in the past and uh, to alleviate that, that burden? What can be done? So, how much time do you have? Uh, so, so, <laughs> let me let me check here. <laughs> so, so this is one where you know I think we, we we have some structural challenges in the sense that in many places uh, we just have it's an aggregate shortfall in the number of units. Like I'm in Atlanta, it is growing with leaps and bounds. People are coming in, and we're not building to meet that demand, and that's going to lead to increases in in prices uh, as we get more into an auction type of environment. Um, the other piece, though, is that you need to be purposeful in making sure that housing is being added to the stock at all price points, uh, because developers in general are going to be drawn more to the higher end, which then means that you have this cascade and people at lower incomes have to move, move further and further out. So we have to think about that as well. Um, and, and then I also think, you know, when I talk about uh, housing and, and affordability, it is a ratio. And so if there are ways that we can get people better wages and skills so that they can have higher incomes, that can also help to alleviate some of the challenges uh, that we move forward. Uh, and then in the current dynamic, you know, if you're not in one of the hot, hot cities and you, you wanna think about like for us, Greenville, South Carolina, uh, is actually that's doing well, but it's not sort of a, an, an urban large city 
a driver of an economy. You have, there are a lot of secondary cities that are close to these places that have become much more uh, in demand as people could sort of work wherever they wanted to work. So for us as Greenville, Asheville, Chattanooga, those places started making Georgia, for example, became much more appealing to a lot of folks that live in Atlanta. Uh, and now the question is, as we're starting to return back to normal, you know, do they keep their places in those locations? Do they come back to Atlanta? And that will have a real implication for uh, the demand for units in those sort of cities. So there, there's gonna be a lot of potential churn and resettlement that happens that will uh, drive some of the outcomes for prices there. Yeah, you had mentioned uh, the current wage growth. It is really strong, um, but the numbers that you cited are not outpacing inflation right now. Um, so how important to your outlook would be seeing that evidence that inflation is coming down, but wage pressures remain? So I'm gonna ask, have you been talking to my research director? Dave talks about this every day. And Dave and I don't talk that, at all. That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, um, uh, that the real wage is, is still not positive uh, relative to inflation. Um, it, it's interesting, when I talk to employers, they know that too, and uh, what, uh, they have described their approach to this is, is that they're trying to set wages to catch up to where inflation is taking, uh, taking prices because their workers and their staffs know that they're falling behind and they can't have that happen. So, um, so that is, at this point, it is a trailing dynamic. Um, and my hope is that that does not become like a, a sort of a permanent feature of how labor markets operate. Um, our surveys suggest that that is not what's happening, uh, that, that businesses are really trying to respond to sort of the near past. And I, I also think it's really important for everyone to remember that the inflation that we're seeing today is really an unprecedented spike. This has happened in a very short amount of time where markets have and, and employers have not had the same kind of advance notice or warning about these things. So, you know, we're going to try to, to get to a place where uh, we start to get that baseline underlying inflation under control. And if we do that soon enough, and I'm, gonna, uh, I'm an optimist, I'm an optimist and I worry at the same time, uh, uh, then perhaps we can avoid uh, expectations starting to shift to those higher levels of, of increments that, uh, that are necessary today. So another dynamic uh, that might affect inflation maybe further out uh, you had talked about, I wrote down what you called it, the, the just-in-case instead of just-in-time inventories, which I love that. And how are you thinking about, you know, as you mentioned, there could be new waves of, of COVID. Um, you never know how that might affect supply chains. Companies are building the just-in-case inventories. Uh, does that set us up for a possible disinflationary impact further out on the horizon? if demand is slowing, but companies are building precautionary inventories. Is it time to think about that? Or is that just sort of a what if or maybe? Yeah, it's, it's sooner than I can think about it. I, I, I got a few other things I have to take care of first, but I do think that this is an interesting question. Like for the whole just in time versus just in case is a real interesting case study for me in the sense that just in time to me is a focus on the first moment on like reducing costs and just getting that, that top line number. And a lot of the attention has not been on what that, the implications are for variance, the second moment. And what we've discovered in the pandemic is that just in time has a pretty high second moment. And that can lead to real disruptions in the final goods market and in the production market in ways that are not so positive. Uh, and so now I think in the last two years, we've seen businesses, now they won't say it like this, but uh, really shift to be much more attentive to the second moment and how this is going to play out. So uh, we have, have contacts that tell us they're building, they're bringing building factories in the United States. They're trying to get three and four different suppliers. All of those are higher cost things. Now, the question that they're wrestling with is exactly how much of this to do. And it gets to your question that, you know, uh, you have to project what demand's going to look like to figure out what the appropriate level of, of um, backup you wanna have. 
Uh, and today, that's very, very difficult to know because uh, we do know that families have a lot more cash today than they did and have his, in historical levels. And so it was a real question. You know, I, I was, uh, it's interesting, I was with uh, a bunch of like entrepreneurs and I asked them, so how do you project what your demand is going to be 18 months from now, two years from now? And they're like, well, we just kind of figure it out. And I was like, but this is a really hard time to be figuring that out, to really know with any kind of certainty what that looks like. That kind of conversation is the same conversation that large firms are having uh, and people all over the country. And how that gets settled will really determine the answer to your question. My guess is that uh, most businesses will, will move to some of this, but they're still going to be pretty conservative in terms of they're not going to ramp up and have twice as much as they need or those sorts of things. Uh, but we'll really just have to see. So that same uh, conversation uh, about uncertainty, do you think that that's why, I'm not asking for you to speak for your colleagues on the FOMC, um, but in the discussions in the boardroom, virtual, I suppose. <laughs> we actually had a first one in person. So, oh, did yes. you? Oh, that's yes. great. It was very nice, the very, uh, just like this, actually. The, uh, does it, does it seem like that uncertainty is what's led to such a wide dispersion of, of views? I mean, when I looked at the forecasts in the SEP and the dot plot in the SEP, it is just a very wide dispersion, which tells economists as Fed watchers, okay, there's not a real strong consensus about where we go from here. So, yeah, I'm, well, first of all, I'm not going to speak for my colleagues. So I'll say that like <laughs> straight away. Um, I guess, you know, one, one thing that... Um, I think everyone has to wrestle with, and all of you as well, is exactly how much to take on board that aggregate demand is going to stay strong as we go through all of these things. Um, I'm saying incredibly hesitant about having any confident on that, confidence on that, and that's one of the reasons why I'm sort of at the low end of the distribution, because if it weakens, uh, our aggressive moves could really exacerbate a already difficult situation. And I, I wanna wait to see how that plays out. Um, I would guess, and you know, I've heard some, some of my colleagues have already spoken in public, uh, that they're taking a very different approach, that they're pretty sure that we have, that, that, that they think demand is gonna stay strong unless we do uh, a lot of um, proactive things. Um, and um, we'll just have to wait and see. I, I do think that this is, a, this is a hard time to be a forecaster. Uh, and particularly when you think, <laughs> when you think about going 24 months out, like that's way out there, given how rapidly events are evolving and how our understanding of the economy is changing. I like to say that if an economist tells you they're accurate uh, more than say two quarters out, and that's that's being optimistic, uh, then they're just lying. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I remember a time when I've revised. The outlook uh, so often and by such magnitudes. Uh, it's been a pretty incredible time. I could imagine it's been an incredible time to be a, a policymaker uh, as well. But is this uh, so? We have about a minute left. Is this your favorite job so far? Best job I've ever had. And, um, you know, in, in part, it's because the issues are, are tremendous and I get to uh, really try to help people understand how the economy works. And that, that's wonderful. Uh, but what really makes it great is the team that I work with, uh, because they are excellent. And so I don't have to deal with a lot of bad things. They just take care of it. And it really allows me to, to do a bunch of other things and, and to uh, think about how our institution can be maximally impactful to help uh, families and businesses get to um, places that they're trying to get to in terms of their lives. So it's been wonderful. Um, I get to talk with folks like you for, oh, uh, for a half an hour and, and um, it's, it's really been great. So I, I just feel grateful every day uh, and I give thanks for having the opportunity to do this. Yeah, well, thank you for the, the keynote. I think this has been a fantastic way to start off uh, the, the conference. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. It's been good to be here. <laughs>